Okay, so we are going to go over a couple of things here. This is the first part of chemistry. I'm not going to go through the whole the whole chapter. I'm just going to go through the basic structure, and then I'm going to talk about bonds and uh, the bonding, especially. Well, not especially any of them. They're all they're all very important. Uh, but we're going to be talking a lot about uh, ions in this class, and we're also going to be talking about polarity, which involves hydrogen bonds. So we'll uh, we'll take some time with that. All right. So in case you weren't paying attention in grade school or junior high or wherever it is you learn this stuff, um, the basic structure of an atom includes this middle part here, which is the nucleus, and that has the protons and the neutrons. Okay, so protons and neutrons make up the nucleus. Around that are electrons, and that's what these guys here are. So if you have protons in here, the protons, protons have a plus, consider it a plus one charge, and then there are neutrons, so if we're making up the nucleus, so neutrons, neutrons have a zero charge, and then around the whole thing are these electrons, and they're very small, but electrons have a minus one charge. Okay, why is that important? Because if you look at this little atom that I just drew, Okay, there's my little electron. You can see that there's one proton with a plus one charge. There's one electron with a minus one charge. So what's the overall charge of this atom? It's going to be zero because there's one positive charge, one, ne one positive charge, one negative charge, so the overall charge is zero. If you look at this one and you say, okay, well there are two protons, so that means it's plus two in the middle, and there are two electrons, I will say, What's the overall charge of this? And you're going to say, eh, it's also zero. Okay, so that's going to come in, come into play later on when we start talking about what happens when the number of electrons and protons and neutrons and stuff differs. Okay, all right. So what we're talking about here right now are the elements. Okay, so there are a number of elements, and since we're focused on physiology, we're kind of concerned about these guys right here because these are the elements. This is the periodic table. So you can see carbon. Carbon sits right over here. Uh, oxygen, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. These are all what they're calling here the big four. Okay. Carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, 96% of what you, what makes you you is composed of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And then we have a bunch that are major elements. Okay, So these are really important and you may as well get used to seeing stuff like this because this is calcium and we typically see calcium ions because they're dissolved in water. Okay, And then we see phosphorus, there's a lot of phosphorus, potassium is another really important one. Uh, sodium is going to be, we're going to see a lot of that. We're going to see some chloride. Uh, we may from time to time see uh, magnesium, which again is a two plus. These are all ions, and we'll talk about what that means here in a minute. Uh, and then you have the trace elements. These things are things that you that, that you need and that are found in there, but but they're they're needed in very, very small quantities. Okay. Um, now the atomic number is listed here. Okay, so I'm going to make a pretty important point here uh, that a lot of people kind of miss. So the atomic number for titanium is 22. That means that titanium has 22 protons. Remember when we saw this and this one had two protons? This one only had one. Well if we look at the periodic table one is hydrogen. So that means if it has one proton, it's hydrogen. Doesn't matter how many electrons, doesn't matter how many neutrons, if it has one proton, it is hydrogen. Therefore, we say that that gives the ID, the identification. That identifies it. The other one had two protons and two neutrons, uh, but specifically, the important thing was that it had two protons, and if it has two protons, it's helium. The number of lithium has three. So the number of Electrons may vary, but if it has three protons, it's a lithium. Okay, so so that's that's a pretty important point. Uh, atomic mass that just when you 
weigh them all together that's something that you get into more in chemistry we're not going to be we're not too concerned with atomic mass at this point um, not really all right so now we just mentioned that what if you have let's say we have one two three four five six seven eight let's say we have eight protons inside now if we if we cheat and we go back here and we look and we say okay if it has eight protons that makes it an oxygen okay so we know that but let's say also that it has and I'm not, I'm not making a real a realistic element here but let's say it has a bunch of neutrons on the inside okay and let's say I add a few I can add a few and then I have a different isotope. I can take a few away. That gives me different isotopes of oxygen. It's still oxygen, but if you change the number, I know you've heard the word isotope before. If you change the number of neutrons, you're just making a different isotope. There, I just made a different, there, I made another one, different isotope of oxygen. Okay, now usually there are only a few isotopes of oxygen. That's why this isn't very realistic. But the concept is that if you change the number of neutrons, you have a different isotope, still of, in this case, oxygen. So I'm changing the, changing the, uh, the isotope. Okay, well, because, because neutrons have mass, they have about the same mass as a proton, it changes the mass of the, of, the, of the atom. But again, we're not too concerned about that right now. The thing that's interesting about isotopes is that in medicine, isotopes are a lot of times used. So uh, for instance, I don't wanna draw, spend too much time drawing on this, but if you have something like iodine that sits right down here, there's iodine, it has 53 protons, okay? I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm making a point here, and it's, and it's important because it's part of your homework. Now, let's pretend there are 53 protons. Now, iodine has a number of different isotopes, okay? And you can vary that number of isotopes and you can make it, let's say, really, really heavy. Well, what happens if you add a whole lot of neutrons, this eventually can become unstable. Okay, because that nucleus is just getting really big and it's almost I almost think of it as like kind of like jello it's like wobbly but really what tends to happen is that it will start to throw off neutrons they'll just it'll it'll start to decay and those neutrons will just fly off some things that are radioactive you hear about radioactive elements that's because their nucleus is unstable and they tend to lose these neutrons at a high rate and they might come off with different amounts of energy okay so um, and that's what this is you have alpha which isn't as bad beta and gamma gamma emissions are are very highly energetic and these things may be so energetic that a radioactive isotope that's a high energy radioactive isotope that emits gamma emission. Sounds very fancy, doesn't it? But all that means is it's decaying, it's losing some of these uh, neutrons, and in the process it's releasing high energy photons, which is which can hit your DNA. That's what this is. This is DNA. And it's this DNA is a molecule, and it might knock out one of those bases in there, just and it can break it and it can cause a mutation. And if you mutate a cell in just the right way, the sun can do this, lots of things can do this. If you mutate this DNA in, such a, in just the right way, it can, one, it can kill the cell because the cell's not gonna be able to function anymore if you hit it somewhere that's really important. Or if you mutate certain genes, it can actually become cancerous. Okay, so that's why radiation can cause cancer. That's why the sun, because the sun is is constantly beating down and and uh, it's sending out radiation of its own. 
and it can also damage this DNA. It can damage cells, it can damage proteins themselves. It's, it's not discriminatory. It doesn't say, oh, that's DNA, we can only damage the DNA. It damages whatever, whatever gets in its way, these high energy beams do. Okay, so what we do, and uh, medical uses as tracers now, is we can monitor, we can measure this energy. So as this energy is coming out, we have sensors that can measure that energy, and you can actually see the energy coming off. You can you can graph it, and you can see the energy. And so another thing, and that's how you can use it as a tracer. Another thing, you give somebody something, a radioactive isotope, and then you can monitor where it is because you can see that energy coming off. Um, for the reason I used iodine as an example is because iodine tends to accumulate in the thyroid gland. Okay, and we're going to get into why that's important later. Uh, what iodine is doing there, but right now we can just say it, it accumulates in the thyroid gland. What's that? We don't know yet, but uh, when it when it does, if you give a radioactive isotope of iodine, then it's very unstable and it will throw off these neutrons and it'll therefore release lots of energy and if you have thyroid cancer and you have a tumor growing there, that's a tumor, then this energy, as these things are flying off and that energy is being released, it's beating up on this cancer. That's the idea. Is it beating up on everything else in the area? Yes. Yes, it, it, it can. It can cause other damage, which is why you don't want to do it for too long. But accumulating that radioactive iodine right in that one area will whittle away at that tumor and you can shrink a tumor just by giving that radioactive isotope. So there are lots of uses for isotopes and again the only difference is that it has a different number of neutrons okay? which in some cases makes it unstable because it releases high energy uh, gamma emissions or it can be or it can just release lower energy emissions that are that are that are less harmful okay and then we can use those as tracers all right the last thing of of these are ions okay so we've already talked about protons and how protons are id that identifies it and neutrons form isotopes so what happens if you change the number of electrons well, remember, if you have, let's say we have three protons, and we have, we're not going to draw any neutrons on this for now, and we have three electrons, well, that's neutral. But what happens if we get rid of one of these? Okay. So what happens if that electron decides to leave? Well, it's no longer neutral. Now you have three positive charges and only two negative charges, which means that you're going to be plus one. If we look at the ID of this, this is lithium, and because it has a charge, it's going to be lithium plus, which makes it the lithium ion. Okay, So now this is going to be a, it's pronounced cation, because we want to focus on this word ion. It's not cation. This is not anion. This is anion. So uh, in the case of chloride, what it does is it tends to, it doesn't have four, uh, it doesn't only have three, but it takes on an extra electron. And when you have more electrons than you have protons, then it tends to be negatively charged, okay? So, so chloride tends to form an anion, okay? Which is a negative charge, okay? And I'll show, I'll show other pictures of this uh, in a minute. Okay, so some of the ions that we're really going to see and every time, pretty much, we talk about sodium, we're talking about this. We're talking about the sodium cation, potassium cation. Okay, so these are all ions. Calcium ion. Uh, calcium is very, very important. Usually, when I ask people what their bones or what uh, calcium is good for, they say bones. Uh, but really, your body uses, your cells use calcium all the time. Muscle cells use calcium. Neurons use calcium. Calcium is a very, very important signaling molecule. Uh, in fact, your body will sacrifice its bones to, uh, to get calcium uh, into the blood when, when your blood calcium levels get low. We'll also see chloride. 
uh, phosphate, we're going to be talking about ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. Uh, hydrogen, we usually think of hydrogen as uh, free hydrogen. Okay, it's also bound to a lot of things. It's bound to just about everything that has carbon, and uh, which is just about everything. And uh, we usually think of this in terms of acids. So something with a lot of hydrogen tends to be acidic. Okay, that means it has a low, it's backwards, pH. Okay, something that's basic um, would have a high pH. Okay, so acidic means low pH. We'll discuss that later on too. All right. So summary: electrons change the number of electrons you get an ion if you change the number of protons that's the identification you have a different element if you add a proton to it it's a different element it's not what it was and if you change the number of neutrons you have an isotope okay so hydrogen hydrogen <clears throat> if you if you take away that electron that's what this is showing if you take away that electron so the electron's gone there. It was here, and now it's gone. Then you have a hydrogen ion. Okay. If you add a neutron, you have you still have hydrogen because it still just has one proton. But now you have a neutron here, which means that you have uh, something called deuterium, which is a hydrogen isotope. Okay. So keep those straight. All right. Okay. So now we're going to start talking about um, bonding. Now this says right here, four primary roles of electrons. Now, the thing about electrons, we have, I'm not going to change colors here. If we have, you know, a few, we'll say we have one, two, three, four, five, six protons here. And then we have out here, one, two, three, four, five. Here, we'll draw it like this. Three, four, five, six. Okay, so these are the electrons on the outside. Who do you think, if you look at this, I can make these bigger. I like to make my electrons small because they're technically much, much smaller than the neutrons and protons. But if this is your atom, and this is what's called an outer shell, where do you think a reaction is going to take place? Do you think the reaction is going to take place in here? No, this is down here, it's down in here, and it's protected. These guys, that first shell is already full. It can only fit two because it's very small. But the outside, these guys are the social ones. They're the ones that are out there interacting with the electrons of other atoms. Okay. So these guys can interact, okay? and they do, and that's what creates bonds. Okay, creates bonds, forms ions, because like I said, if these guys leave or it takes on more, um, then, then you have, <clears throat> you have that, that ion. Um, takes on or loses. Uh, high energy electron, electron carriers, there are a number of atoms that have, that have extra electrons in them. Okay, and those are, those are important. We'll talk about that when we talk about uh, metabolism. We'll talk about electron carriers, uh, NADH, NADPH, things like that. Um, and then free radicals. Now, every now and then, I'll say something about that. It's not, it's not incredibly um, important because we're, we're only going to mention it this one time. But a lot of times in normal reactions, what happens is a molecule, we can say, you know, uh, we'll say this is a molecule, will have an extra electron just sitting out there and exposed. That electron is going to react with the next thing that it sees. This is called a free radical. And we create these all the time with little electrons sitting outside just waiting to react. Okay, And it will. It will react with whatever it, whatever it comes into contact with next. And those are called free radicals. If it's a collagen, it will damage the collagen protein, whatever. Um, and so we have the system in place called antioxidants that will absorb that. And so when this guy is ready to start causing trouble, instead, if you have antioxidants in your system, the antioxidants are designed to react with that, and it will remove that electron, and then this thing will be harmless 
and that electron won't do any harm to anything else. Okay, so that's why we take antioxidants. It's a, it's a very, antioxidants are very important and very real. Okay, but again, it's the electrons, the electrons sitting out here. The electrons are the ones that are interacting for whether it's good or bad. Usually, it's usually it's good. Okay, so but they're also the ones that form bonds. Okay, so they're the ones that are actually interacting with the next door neighbors here. Uh, to form these bonds. Now, bonds capture energy. So we have a couple of things here. I, I just said bonds link atoms, um, or that electrons form the bonds, and the, and the bonds then link those atoms together. But it takes energy. There's, there's energy contained in this bond. And what I've drawn here, this is glucose. Okay. Glucose is a sugar. This is fat. Also, we could call that a lipid. More specifically, it's a triglyceride. Tri meaning three. It has three tails. One, two, three. Okay. We know that glucose is energy. Okay. We know. Have you ever, if you've ever roasted a marshmallow, marshmallow is uh, is sugar, and pretty much just mostly sugar. And we know that if we light a marshmallow on fire that it will burn all by itself. We can put it in there for a brief period of time, light it on fire, and then we can just hold it up and it will just burn like a torch, okay? That means that marshmallow had energy inside it that it's now releasing, okay? What it's doing is these bonds are breaking. And when it breaks, it releases energy, okay? So as those bonds break, energy is released and usually well not usually uh, but when we're burning marshmallows or sugar we see that as fire okay that's supposed to be fire okay so so that's where the burning comes from that's where the energy is the energy is actually re contained in this bond okay so fats are the same thing if you burn if you you can burn fat and it will release energy and it will too it will also burn releases carbon dioxide and water that's that's the reaction that ultimately that ultimately comes from it um, and so we know that they're that they're containing that they contain that energy and that when we eat sugar to get energy of course we don't set it on fire inside our bodies we break these bonds enzymatically we use enzymes that will carefully take this apart and then it will release some of that energy, and we use that energy to make something called ATP, which we'll talk about when we talk about metabolism. Okay, so I might mention this again when we when we discuss that. Okay, uh, so these linking of atoms, we're going to talk about covalent bonds, we're going to talk about ionic bonds, and we're going to talk about hydrogen bonds. Uh, we're also going to come back and we're going to talk about polar. So if we have something like water, water uses a, it's kind of a spoiler here, covalent bond. And I will say specifically that it is a polar. This might not mean anything to you yet, but it's a polar covalent bond. Fats also are covalent bonds, but they are nonpolar covalent bonds. Again, this may not mean anything to you. Uh, but but once we figure out what polar and nonpolar means, you'll think, oh, okay, that makes sense. I hope. All right, uh, ionic bonds. Those are things that, well, if we have sodium and we have chloride, we put them together. Opposites attract, right? Opposite charges attract. Then we have a salt, sodium chloride. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about those. Uh, okay, so first of all, ionic bonds, atoms gain or lose electrons. Remember, we had a nucleus in here and we had electrons on the outside of it. Okay, so if we lose electrons or if we gain extra electrons, we create an ion. Okay, opposite charges attract. Again, we saw that we had sodium, which was positively charged, chloride, which is negatively charged. They're attracted to each other. and you end up with a salt, sodium chloride. Covalent bonds, 
share electrons. So we'll we'll see. I have some pictures down here that'll make this a lot easier, and we'll see that. So first of all, let's talk about the uh, the ionic bonds. Here's a sodium. Now there's a special property. It's called the octet rule or the rule of eight, which says that for anything larger than a helium, so hydrogens and heliums, they only uh, they only get two. But in the outer shell out here, it can hold a total of eight. Okay, so one, so it could technically have eight electrons out here, and then it moves up to the next shell. So to, uh, to go back to this, I said hydrogen is really small. It only gets two. So the very inner shell only gets two. But once that's full, it starts to fill the next shell. And you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so this shell is full. So now it's ready to start the next shell. If you look at sodium, this is what this is how sodium is made. It's got one little electron sitting out there in this outer shell all by itself. So sodium says, you know, I'd really like to have a full outer shell. What are my chances of recruiting in seven more electrons? Mm, not so good. What are my chances of just booting this one out? Pretty good. So that's what it tends to do. It tends to boot that out. Okay, so that tends to leave. It's very easily, it's not that sodium tells it to leave, it's that it's very easily drawn off by water. Anything will, will pull that electron off of there. Okay, so in this case, it's showing that it's moving over here to chloride. Okay, so here's chloride, and it's got, this shell is full, it has eight in it, so it started building another one, and it got all the way up to seven. Okay, so it has seven in its outer shell, and it thinks, oh, I'd really like to have eight okay it wants to have eight but so it can either dump all of these well that's not that's not going to make any sense because that would give it a really really high charge if it loses all those electrons what's much easier is it for just just for it to grab one more electron and now it's happy it has the full Eight. So it added its eighth electron. So chloride tends to take them on. Now if we do the math and we remember those really simple things, and that is that an electron is negatively charged, well when this one loses a negative charge, what's that going to do? It's not losing any protons, it still has the same number of protons. If it loses one, elect one negative charge, that's going to make it a charge of plus one. This one takes on an electric it takes on an electron with its negative charge without changing the number of protons. It's going to make it minus one. Okay, so you end up with Cl minus and Na, Na plus. Okay, Na is the uh, the the symbol for sodium. Okay, so that's what this is showing. It's showing after that transition. Uh, that the chloride actually, and that's, I guess, a pretty important point, it actually took on an extra electron. Okay, So it owns it now. This electron is now part of chlorine. Sodium gave its up. Okay, So its electron is gone. They both have full outer shells. Everybody's happy, except they have this little charge issue. Well, now they're kind of attracted to each other. Okay. Now, did sodium actually give chloride that electron? Probably not. It doesn't really matter. Anything can pull the electron off of sodium, uh, and chloride will take its electron from anywhere. But it helps to, un to, to make sense out of how an, uh, how an ionic bond forms by thinking, OK, well, sodium gave up an electron. Chloride gained an electron. Now they're oppositely charged by one. And so we end up with sodium chloride. Okay, and that's going to form this salt crystal that we that we see here. Okay, so and they all they all stick together just 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 like that, form the little salt cube. All right, covalent bonds. They actually share a pair of electrons. So here's hydrogen. Remember, I said hydrogen wants to have it's it's the teeny tiny one. If we go back to the periodic table, it's the very first one listed. It has one little proton. Um, but it also, just like everybody else, wants to have a full shell. The trouble is its shell can only get two. Okay, So it, it only gets two in its outer shell. It's the only one, Hydro hydrogen and helium. They only get two in their outer shell. 
but it still wants to have a full shell, and the full shell for it means two. Now for every other element, a full shell means eight. So here's oxygen, and oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six, little pink ones here. It has six in its outer shell. And it's thinking, hmm, I would really like to have eight. So here's hydrogen that comes by saying, okay, I tell you what, I'm not going to give you my electron like chloride did, but I would, because I want one too, and you want one, we both want an extra electron, let's just share. I'll, I'll borrow yours for a little while, you can borrow mine for a little while, I can pretend I have two, and you can pretend you have an extra. Well, chloride, well, oxygen is actually missing two in its outer shell, so it's going to react with two hydrogen. That's why H2O is H2O, okay? Because oxygen is actually missing two in its outer shell, so it can react with two of these hydrogens, okay? And it seems very, very fair, right? They're sharing electrons. Oxygen says, you know, you ask oxygen, hey, how many, how many electrons do you have in your outer shell? It says, yeah, I got eight. You ask hydrogen, yeah, I got two, but there's a problem. Um, do you really think it's fair? If you tell a big kid to share with a little kid, you really think that big kid is, the little kid and the big kid are going to get the toy or whatever they're sharing for the same amount of time? No. Oxygen is a bully. Oxygen is more electronegative, and so it actually... If I were to ask you, where do you think those electrons are most of the time? And you said, well, oxygen looks, you know, a little shady, so I think he's probably keeping them most of the time. You would be right. Oxygen keeps those electrons way more than hydrogen. Hydrogen doesn't get a good deal out of this. And so what tends to happen is that this side becomes negative. Remember, electrons are negatively charged. So... If oxygen is holding on to that electron more than, and the electron's negatively charged, then this side of the molecule tends to be negative, and this side, because it's missing these electrons, tends to be a little bit positive. Okay, remember earlier when I started talking about polarity? Okay, it's like poles of a magnet. Okay, you have the positive pole which is down here on this side, and you have the negative pole, which is up here on this side, okay? Now, if we were to count, so we have 10 electrons right here, and if you look at, if you were to count protons, you would have one, and then oxygen has eight, and then this one has one, that's 10 protons. So what we have is 10 protons, and 10 electrons. Are you following me? I hope so. So if this has, because this one has eight protons, and each of these has one proton, and if you look at the periodic table, you'll see that that's true. It's gonna be number eight on the electron, uh, periodic table. So that's 10, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 electrons. So we have, it is neutral. We just said that it kind of has a positive charge and a negative charge, but that's polarity. Okay, so keep those straight. Make sure you make sure you understand those things that um, because that's what I'm saying here. Is here's this water. It's a polar molecule because it's a little bit negative. It's always going to be negative on the oxygen side because the oxygen is the electron hog. It's the bully, and the poor little hydrogen over here doesn't have the electrons, but its proton isn't going anywhere, so it's partially positively charged, okay? But overall, it still has 10 electrons, 10 protons, it is neutral, okay? So this is the trick question that sometimes pops up when I say, is water a charged molecule? No, it's not a charged molecule. It's polar, and I think now would be as good a time as any. What does polar mean? The best definition I've seen of polar, because we're going to see the word polar again, is an unequal distribution of charge. OK? 
Okay, so this definition works for a lot of things. Polar means it has an unequal distribution of charge. Okay, so in this case, overall neutral, but it's polar. All right. Um, now, if we think about, let's see, we'll just draw one of these out. Right. There's a water. There's a water. Okay. So to these guys, what about the interaction these guys might have with each other? Okay. If this is neutral and this is neutral, well, opposites attract. They're not really opposites. So they are they going to be attracted to each other? If you're thinking and you're following me, you might say, well, wait a minute. If you, if this is a little bit negative here and that's a little bit positive on this side, then maybe, just maybe, when two water molecules come together, that negative charge might actually be attracted to that positive charge. And that's exactly what we see. And this, not to be true dramatic, but this is why we're doing things like looking for water on Mars. Okay? This is why we say water is essential to life. It's because we have this little interaction that takes place here between the partially positive hy hydrogen and the partially negative oxygen of a water molecule. And that is called a hydrogen bond. Okay, is it really a bond? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is. I mean, in the case of water, water's moving all over the place, so it's, it's a very, very, very temporary bond. So this guy might be rushing past, and it, and it might, you know, hang out a little bit longer than it normally would, and then it's going to see another oxygen down here. And so that hydrogen will then interact with that one, and they're moving all over the place all the time. Uh, but, but they do have this interaction, and that's what a hydrogen bond is. Now, this is very important, so I hope you're understanding this, because this is, again, where the trick question comes in. What is actually holding this hydrogen to that oxygen? Remember, they're sharing electrons. And what do we call that? Covalent. So what's actually, so this is, this is the take home message here. What is actually holding the water molecule together? Covalent bonds. What is causing an interaction between two water molecules? Hydrogen bonds. Okay, so we have hydrogen bonds and covalent bonds working at the same time, and you need to keep them straight. You need to say, oh, yeah, it's being held together by a covalent bond. But two water molecules do associate with each other through this thing called a hydrogen bond. Okay, And that's what we see in this picture. So we see all of these guys, and they're all moving around. It's, it's hard to show in a picture, but they're all moving all over the place. But if you were to take a snapshot, if you were to take a picture, if there was a way to do that at any one time, you would see that they would be lined up just like this. You would see the hydrogens as close as they can get to the oxygens. Okay? These are all hydrogen bonds. Okay? All of these are. All of these little interactions here, hydrogen bonds. Okay, so what does that mean for us? Well, let's say you have a bunch of water molecules in a pan or a beaker, make this bigger, in a pan or a beaker, then what you would see is that they would be hydrogen bonding with each other. Okay. They, they're going to be hydrogen bonding with each other. And so, if I were to try to heat this, they have a high heat capacity. They can hold on to a lot of energy. Why? Because they have hydrogen bonds. So you're heating this up, and you're heating it, and, there, and that's what heat is. When you heat a liquid it's, or anything, it, its molecules are just moving faster and faster and faster and faster, 
until phew, eventually one of them flies off. Well, if these guys like each other so much, water is very self-loving, uh, so it loves other other water molecules, and so you're heating it, but it doesn't, they don't really want to leave each other, and so they're kind of holding on to each other, almost like a magnet. And so it takes a lot of energy to get that to fly off. In fact, the fact that water is a liquid at room temperature is one of the most interesting properties of it. We're used to it because, of course, it's water. At, it's liquid at room temperature. It's water. Uh, but it's actually kind of unusual, and it's only because it forms these hydrogen bonds that that even takes place. And so that's one of the reasons it's really, really important to, for, for life. If we look at something like methane, a methane, and an, you put another methane molecule right next to it, they don't care about each other. Why would they? I mean, even if there was unsharing of uh, unequal sharing of electrons, there's not going to be any weird distribution of charge because it's it's symmetric. It's they're all they're all around there, and so there is no there is no link between this one and this one. So if you were to heat this up, if you were to have this in a beaker or whatever. It's a very bad beaker and you were to heat it up it wouldn't take anything at all and they're like okay whatever you know they start moving around they just fly off okay so that means that methane is a gas at room temperature okay so methane we think of methane as being a gas uh, and that's because it has no association with itself water is different and that's very important another thing especially if you're um, if you like you know water spiders or something like that if we take some of this water here, let me draw it this way if we take some of this our water that we had earlier and we pour it out it's supposed to be a drop and we pour it and we cause a water droplet this drop this is supposed to be a water droplet here okay that's a water drop okay it's a lot bigger than what I drew here um, but you get the idea it forms a a bead okay so when water tends to drip on the floor or something like that it forms a bead why does it form a bead that's kind of odd I mean we're used to it of course but it's still kind of weird what's going on in there well all the water molecules are trying to be as close as they can to other water molecules so if this water molecule wants to slip away it's not going to it's going to try to stay up here and it's going to try to get as small as it can it's going to try to associate with all of these guys all the time and so it forms these little beads okay and that's surface tension okay and surface tension is important for a lot of reasons um, and one of those, I mean, how does this relate back to physiology? It relates in a very important way. So it's something that you hopefully understand, at least this concept of water tension. You need to understand hydrogen bonding and polarity. Because what happens with a premature infant? When you have a premature infant, it... Uh, one of the things that you usually see is these babies come out and the doctor says, oh, it's perfectly healthy. Uh, but it's on a respirator or a ventilator. And it's got something that's like helping it breathe. And you're thinking, well, gosh, what's what's wrong, doc? And then, ah, you know, he just too much surface tension within the lungs. OK, so what does that mean? Well, I'm going to go into a lot of detail. But what happens is that the water that's inside the alveoli of the lungs tends to stick to itself. And so what it does is it snaps these alveoli shut. And so your alveoli, which are the parts where you have gas exchange in the lungs, can't do anything. The water is just sticking to itself. It's attracted to the other water and it just shuts up, fills with water and pulls that thing closed. Okay, But after a while, usually late in development, that surface tension is relieved by something called a surfactant. And the baby, after a certain stage of development, will start to form surfactant. Those will open up. Everything's fine. 
and uh, and and it and it can be it can go on its way just fine. Okay, so so this idea of polarity, water surface surface tension, um, the polarity of water is really really important for everything we're going to be doing. Okay, so I'm going to uh, hopefully get the next section up here in a minute. So um, good luck.